Thank you very much for joining us today for the Battery Insiders podcast here live from the Lithium Ion Battery Americas 2024, hosted by Shanghai Metals Market SMM. I'm very delighted to have Ryan Melzer with us today, who is the CEO, CTO, and Director of ABTC, which is the American Battery Technology Company. Thanks for joining us. Yes, yeah, great to be here. Perfect. Let's right go into it. Um, maybe if you could start by introducing a bit ABTC, your mission, your vision. Yes, of course. So at American Battery Technology Company, we're really working to address supplying domestic critical materials within the U.S. So many of us worked for many years at domestic U.S. battery manufacturers. A lot of our founders were part of the initial team that helped to design and build the first Tesla Gigafactory near Reno. So we spent many years designing manufacturing process and cell layouts and utility systems and commissioning and ramping cell manufacturing lines. And from spending many years doing that, we really saw a void in the market for how to do essentially the reverse of that. So many recyclers we vetted at the time take whole batteries and simply drop them in shredders or drop them in furnaces and really mix everything together. We saw there was an opportunity for a much more systematic and strategic method of backing up manufacturing processes to disassemble packs and modules and cells and really get access to the high value materials without simply mixing everything together. So about four years ago, myself and, and much of my team, you know, we formed ABTC. Um, we really were able to demonstrate this technology early on. We ended up winning a competition hosted by BASF. We then won a, a competition hosted by the US automakers, by Ford and General Motors and Stellantis. And then since then, we've really designed and built our first commercial scale battery recycling plant. We started it up last fall and we're now in commercial scale production, really helping to provide recycled materials to the domestic market. And it's very important to be able to close the loop to really take those metals and once they're in the U.S., keep them in circulation. But because the amount of batteries in the field is growing so quickly, recycling on its own isn't enough. So in addition to our battery recycling business, we've also developed a set of technologies for how to manufacture a lithium product from a U.S.-based resource. So within central Nevada, we have a material called a claystone, which has a lot of lithium in it. But to date, there's been no process that can access the lithium in it in an economic fashion. So again, about three years, we developed a technique for how to liberate the lithium, how to purify it, and how to make a battery-grade lithium hydroxide. So we proved it at the bench scale two years ago. We built a pilot plant over this past year, and we now have an operational demonstration facility that really shows how we can make this critical material from a US-based resource. Great, and well, thanks for sharing that. And I think that's a bit unique about you guys, right? So that you do both, like, you know, you work with like the raw source of lithium in this case, and then you also want to take recycled materials. And maybe if you can share a bit some of your lessons learned, maybe some of the synergies you see, right, between doing both, because it's a bit of a unique approach. Mostly we look at, you know, more the refiners or we look at the recycling companies, and maybe some are both because they acquired both. But I mean, it would be interesting to kind of learn a bit about this and also, yeah, your history there as well, like how you ended up doing both. Yes, I think the reason we do it is just we see that the industry has to have both. You, you can't meet demands just through recycling and you can't meet demands by large, large amounts of primary material if you're not closing up at the end. So we, we don't see how it's possible to do just one or the other. And the, the big thing is that it's the exact same skill sets you need of the engineers, the scientists to develop both processes, same skill sets of the operators for the plants. We make materials from both businesses the same specifications and we sell them to the same customers. So large amounts of synergies and overlap there. And when we speak to our potential customers, the big automakers and battery cell manufacturers, they see recycling as valuable and they know it needs to happen. But if you look at the entire recycling industry the next few years, it takes a while to grow. But when we show them the numbers of the lithium resource that we have, the technology for how to manufacture it and the scale we can move at, that's what gets them excited. Because this primary lithium is what really moves the needle because of the magnitude of it. And it's just fortunate they don't have to choose one or the other. We have recycled material now we work with them on as we're constructing and developing this primary resource. Thanks. And maybe what's also interesting about this two ideas, right? One is, you're probably aware, right, in Europe that we have 
new EU battery regulation, which has a requirement to use recycled materials in fresh batteries. So it's become a requirement, right, like a license to operate in the end of the day. Um, and I think the second topic would be then, if you look, so you mentioned lithium a few times, right? So are you also looking at the other materials from the battery you can recycle? Because often lithium has been more material people haven't recycled as much. It becomes more relevant now with LFP because there's not much else in there really from, from value. But of course, you also look at cobalt, nickel from the MMC, et cetera. So maybe if you could share a bit on that. And second, are you taking it from a, like, say, you're, you're taking like, you know, a battery and you kind of take it apart? Or do you look more at like, get black mass from another kind of supplier and take it out from there? Right, so for a recycling facility, we actually make nine different products. So lithium is one of them. But like you mentioned, we also make nickel and cobalt and manganese and aluminum and copper and several other products which really helps to diversify and de-risk that business. Because those metal prices tend to move up and down out of phase from each other. It helps protect the business unit. But it really does help to scale that up and be able to produce different technologies for, for different sets of customers. It's definitely fascinating the lithium because we spoke a lot about companies right, who recycle everything apart from the lithium. They had like, you know, containers of material right, where lithium is in there, but they haven't taken it out yet. Well, I think that's part of doing a ground-up design for recycling as well. A lot of the early recycling plants were actually designed not for batteries, but were designed for general metal scrap, for aluminum, for steel. And people have tried to put batteries into those systems. And they can physically work and recover a few elements. They can recover the nickel, the cobalt, the copper. But if it's not purpose-built for batteries, it makes it difficult to recover the other elements. So again, we designed this from a blank piece of paper for batteries as the design feed. And because of that, we can recover all nine of those products at high recovery rates and make it much more of a holistic system. We recover large amounts of the battery by mass and not just a few token elements. And that's also another discussion we had a lot about, again, looking also from regulatory, but also other demands to actually get back to battery grade, right? Because a lot of you know, companies maybe can recover some material, some elements you mentioned, but then it's not to the quality standard that you can actually use in new batteries. Maybe if you could share a bit more on that, also your journey maybe with BSF. Yes, of course. So I mentioned we, we won a competition from BSF early on. They're one of the only companies right now that actually manufactures high energy density cathode material within the U.S. So for a recycler, the, the ideal partner, they're the perfect customer for the products that we make. So we've been sending them samples of our recycled products for several years initially small-scale samples, now much larger batches, really showing the quality of the product we make and that we make it specifically to the specifications that they need for the input to their plant. And after working with them for many years, last summer we actually signed a, a partnership agreement with them. Whereas we really are focusing on the collection, the recycling within North America, are we able to make our recycled metal products and sell those products to BSF for them to directly make into their cathode material. So us having this partnership means when we speak with customers, we speak with automotive OEMs, we can say, you know, we as a combined partnership can provide you a certain percentage of cathode with recycled content, with IRA compliant domestic content that's of low environmental impact and be able to provide more of a turnkey service. You know, you can provide your end of life material and then go all the way to purchasing recycled content cathode back out of it again. Great, and maybe another topic is cost, right? Material cost. Um, we had this today in the conference, right? We also heard about like, you know, the examples of half the cost in produced in China compared maybe in the US, manufacturing, etc. Of course, also from a raw material standpoint, is this something you can get to a price point similar to like, you know, Asia or China? From lithium, if you source it from here, to compared to other sources, or is it not needed because you have to IA in? Kind of protect you. It would be interesting to get your thoughts on that as well. The IRA is definitely impactful, but for the recycling side, again, there, there would be such high costs with transporting those materials such long distances. If you really were to try to transport them back to Asia to refine and ship them back again, those are big cost disadvantages of doing it in Asia. So our recycling plant can really undercut those, and by being close to our suppliers and customers, can be very cost competitive. And on the primary lithium side, you know, again, there really aren't any commercial scale plants that can access lithium from a claystone material. There are a handful of lithium claystone bearing deposits throughout the world, but it's a very different type of process than trying to recover lithium from 
a hard rock spotamine, or to recover it from a lithium rich brine. Much less energy intensive, much less chemical reagent intensive. So competing on price based on the actual process, as opposed to, to simply other areas, is what we can do with our technique. And the type of lithium hydroxide we make, we can deliver specifically to US and North American based cathode customers. Great. And maybe another aspect also is sustainability, right? So, from it would be interesting if you could share a bit more of that as well. You already mentioned shipping, right, which is a concern, and, but also many other, any other aspect, any other innovations in this space? Yes, for the primary lithium, again, the way it's made today usually has very large amounts of chemical agent consumption, very large amounts of acid, different types of solvents and oxidizers needed to purify the material. That's what drives a lot of the costs, but it also drives a lot of the environmental footprint, especially when you consider you know, scope two and three type emissions. So again, we don't have to use very large amounts of chemical agents. We actually have a refinery will be built directly on top of the resource itself. So many processes today have a mine and a concentration area in one spot of the world, and then a refinery in a whole different continent. So having the refinery directly on top of the resource greatly reduces the amount of transportation and the environmental impact. And the same thing on the recycling side. You know, we have no high temperature operations no combustion on site anywhere, very low amounts of chemical agents are used, which means not a lot of wastewater is generated. And we do that because it's a much more holistic process that really lets us recover more types of materials at higher recovery rates and at lower cost. Yeah, if you could maybe share a bit more right on this recycling process you mentioned, is it more like hydro, pyro, I mean, I would assume not a pyro process if you're talking about temperature, but yeah, is there anything more you could share on that process? Or? Yes, those are pretty broad categories, you know, if you're pyrometallurgy, hydrometallurgy. So the, the start of our process really is much more of an automated disassembly that removes a lot of the support material from the batteries, removes the byproducts that can be sold. And then as we go to the back end, it's within the hydrometallurgy family. But unfortunately, a lot of people just think that hydrometallurgy means one specific technology of solvent extraction. But there are many different types of technologies within the hydromet family. And we've designed what we think is a much more holistic set of processing techniques that make a single circuit that let us recover different products at battery grade purity without just using solvent extraction trains, which is really the, the conventional method. And maybe if you could talk a bit more about the IIA, right? And how it is affected that we also had this today already in some of the discussions, how big of a difference it made, right, for the US. Um, yeah, if you maybe could share a bit more how this is impacting your business and what some of the Implications on that? Yes, IRA is important. I mean, a lot of people look at the, the 30D credit, which is really the $7,500 that consumers can get when they purchase an electric vehicle. But there are many other programs within that system that really prioritize making these minerals in the US. Last summer, the Department of Energy and the IRS you know, really put out this other program, you know, an investment tax credit through the 48C program, which is really meant to really defer a lot of capital costs to help ramp up domestic facilities. We put applications in last summer, you know, final rounds last fall, and just a few weeks ago we actually were notified that, you know, we'd won a, a 20 million dollar credit for our current battery recycling facility, and we're already going through design and planning for our next battery recycling plant because of the amount of material we have under negotiations. And we also want a, a $40 million credit to be applied towards our next battery recycling plant. So that the subsidies received at the consumer level for vehicles is great, but we're also receiving these, these credits towards you know, construction of new recycling facilities within the US. Great, maybe if you could share a bit for some people who don't know about it, right, with the, the tax credit, how this works, like uh, practically. It's a very competitive program that you have to apply to. You know, large amounts of applications submitted over the past year. And just end of March, the DOE and IRS announced the winners. They said around you know, 9% of requested funds were awarded. So very competitive. And now essentially for the 20 and the $40 million awards, we have award letters from the federal government that we really can apply to these capital facilities. So as we build the plants out, as we order the equipment, as we turn on these facilities, we're essentially already awarded funds to be reimbursed for a lot of the costs that we spent on those plants. And you get this back through a tax credit as well? Or? 
Yes, it's a credit we receive back once we have you know, constructed these facilities and show them operational. Cool, perfect. And then, um, I think maybe also another question would be like to, to run a company like this right now in the US, but maybe some of your learnings in there as well, also maybe perception of it, was any change over the couple of years you have been operating with it? Any things which surprised you? I'm not surprised, but I think it's, there's a lot of dimensions to it. There's obviously technology development, there's building the business model in the case, there's the competitive landscape. But I think as we move into a closed loop infrastructure here in the US, the most important thing is, is the relationships built with companies in other sectors of the closed loop. So with the cathode manufacturers, the battery manufacturers, the vehicle OEMs, the most important thing is having those relationships. And you know, I think there are a lot of people trying to enter this field, but very few who can actually back things up with more than a PowerPoint deck. You know, actually making material, delivering samples, building facilities, showing you're doing what you said you would do. That's how you formalize partnerships with companies and other spaces. And I think building those relationships is the most important factor for who will be successful going forward. That makes a lot of sense. And I think, yeah, as you said, partnership is also very crucial to where to get your material from. I guess you have your own you know, source there, which is really helpful, but also from recycling, right? Like, you know, which, I guess, do you get it from scrap or would you get it from end of life vehicles? Maybe if you could share a bit on this as well. All the above. I mean, early on in the industry, we get a fair amount from strategic automakers and battery manufacturers and a fair amount from brokers and aggregators. As we go forward, I think OEMs are seeing the importance of maintaining control over these critical elements. So a larger percentage comes from them going forward as their service centers start collecting end-of-life material. And that's where I come back to again. Having those relationships and partnerships lets you maintain access to your feed from your suppliers and then to sell your product back into their own supply chain. Fantastic, Ryan. Really appreciate your time today and sharing your insights also with our audience. Um, my name is Simon Engeke, founder and chair of Battery Associates. I'm very excited to have you on the Battery Insiders podcast. Of course, it's great to be here. Thank you.